When I was a boy, we tramped these old tailing heaps and we knew every ridge and creek and gully, Joneses and Germans and Sailors and Donnellys and the Mont d'Or. Watch out for the old shafts, my dad used to say, and stay out of the tunnels. day there were still old timers about who could tell us what it all meant. How do you pass on to your own son this feeling for the place you grew up in? Come on, Chris, meet you to the top. They tore out all the boulders, dug tunnels south and north. They set the crushes pounding the long way to the north. The junction and the union, the mother and the grand, they found them Digging the labor of their hands. There's gold, gold, gold in the mountains. There you are, Chris. There's the old place. I wonder what it was like when Ross started, even before you were a boy. Was that road out there the main road then? Sixty years before I was a boy here, this was Ross, a town in its heyday, a century ago. Over 3,000 people crammed in this little valley. A hospital, four churches, two newspapers, more than 30 hotels, and a daily coach service to Hokotika, up the beach to the north. That's how you'd see it, Chris, rolling in in a Cobb & Co coach from Hokotika and looking south to where we're standing. There's Bond Street on the terrace where Ross started in 1865. All those pubs, the Dunstan, the Provincial, the Bendigo, the post office, and the camp. What if they all come to us? Gold brought them to us, Chris. Gold in all the creeks and gullies. How did they get the gold? The water concentrated it in the gravels in the bed of the stream. And then they came along, the diggers came along with their tin dishes and just completed the process. Like this. Hey, would you like to have a go? of the Roddy Nugget, and it weighed 100 ounces almost, and gold's worth $100 an ounce now, so you work it out, 100 times 100. How else did they get the gold out of the penny? They always ended up with the pan, but they had to use other methods before it. But if you want any real gold, you better get panning, old chap. Here they are, hard at work in the bed of Jones's Creek. These fellas are using water to break down a gravel bank and a primitive little hydraulic nozzle. They were making $40 a day per man at Jones's in 1865. But then the diggers found something novel. Where Jones's Creek ran out of its gully and onto the flat, layer upon layer of gold was discovered mm. down to 400 feet. They sunk shafts and hauled up the dirt by hand at first. But then they had to use horsepower. Come on, look here, Chris. Here's a good example of a horse whim. Now, Basil built this for his museum, and I bet he can show you just how it operate. Yes, certainly. Now, the way the horse whim works, Chris, is that um, you have a big revolving drum, and you connect a horse to that, and the horse walks round and round and round in a circle. And as the horse walks round, the full bucket of wash dirt comes right up from the bottom of the shaft right up to the bin and is tipped in the bin. And while the full bucket of wash dirt's coming up, the empty one is going down. Now, when they do that part of it, they turn the horse round and the whole process is reversed. As the empty one goes down, the next full bucket comes up. What happens to the dirt when it get puts, gets put in this bin here? Well, when the bin is full, sometimes it takes up to a day to fill it when they're in very, very hard digging. Um, they turn the water on and uh, knock out the bottom um, chocks in the bin and all the gravel is washed over the riffles and that um, collects all the gold and all the tailings are washed right into a big heap at the end. Well, how deep is, would this mine be? Well, a horseworm, uh, when 
usually goes down to somewhere up to about 100 feet. Um, any deeper than that, it's too hard for the horses to lift. Yes, Chris, when they got below 100 feet, they were really in trouble and they had to use steam power. Basil's got a good photograph on the wall over here, one of these early steam plants at Ross. Companies like the Morning Star had shafts up to 400 feet deep and had to haul up gravel and water by steam power. But where would they get the steam engines then? Plenty of those, Chris. Steamships wrecked on the river bar at Hokitika. The deeper they went, the harder it was to get rid of the water. It beat them in the end. The steam companies disappeared. They had to find another way. A mile-long underground tunnel drained the flat and so mining started again, this time with big hydraulic nozzles. These mighty jets of water tore down the gravel banks and washed them through the sluice boxes. This is what the hydraulic nozzles and the bucket elevators did, Chris, made this great big hole. The sides of it used to be 120 feet high before it was full of water. You know, the mines department reckoned that out of it, they got five and a half tons of gold. And now it's filled with everybody's rubbish. John Friedrich Conke, native of Germany, who was killed by a landslip at Donnelly's Creek, December the 24th, 1878, aged 34 years. Well, he had been killed on his gold claim. Yes, Chris, probably through a sluicing operation. If you have a look round the cemetery here and you'll find that lots of the graves of poor old miners who got killed when they were digging for gold. Well, he comes from Germany. Where did everybody else come from? All over the world. Some of them from England, some from Germany, Ireland, the United States, and most of them had followed the gold trail all around the edge of the Pacific before they ended up here on the west coast at Ross. sentimental in this one. Now you have a look at this one over here. Death cannot make our souls afraid. If God be with us there, we may walk through our darkest shade and never yield to fear. Mm. You know, Chris, the headstones are a bit like some of the old houses here, full of sentiment. Hey, Dad, I saw this place in one of your old photos. It's over a hundred years old. Joe Grimmond used to live here, and he came to Ross in 1865. Old Joe Grimmond really had the gold boat. When the rush to the Yukon broke out in the 1890s, he went too. But he came back to Ross and was a big man in local politics when Dick Seddon was at his prime. look in the window there. When I was a boy, I used to play Chinese checkers in that room with old Mrs. Grimmer, and she was nearly 90. When they built this place in 1902, Someone complained that it looked like a cheese box. But this is where the Rossborough Council had its home until 1972, when Western County took over. Cheese box or not, to me the old Coronation Hall is one of the coast's most distinctive buildings. where the Ross Borough Council used to meet, Chris, when your granddad was mayor, and all the important things about the Borough of Ross were decided in this room. Hmm. What was that, that story you used to tell us about the time when your granddad was elected mayor? Well, that was a bit of a disaster. Our granddad took the new town council up to Tommy Cummings' pub to shout for them, and while they were there, the police came down from Hokitika and caught the lot of them for drinking out their hours. <laughs> new mayor and new council as well. <laughs> you look through the window there, you see down by the coast? See the old world? See, that's where Granddad used to work. By World War I, 
The gold had given out and Ross turned to timber. In the 1920s, Stuart and Chapman built their big mill and the town took a new lease of life. Jim Jones was one of the early mill gang, Chris, and he'll tell you what it was like. Well, she's a sorry enough looking sight, but now, with the rain on her, she's a damn sight worse. Yet, she would turn out 30,000 feet of timber a day, and she was one of the biggest producers of indigenous timber in the South Island. She was cutting timber, the smoke was belching up, you know, from the funnels, the saws was more or less singing. Great, great era. Great, yeah. What's that hole on the side of the mill for? Not vandalism, actually. Wreckers, yes. In there was one of the most modern pieces of equipment we had in the mill, and that was the big band mill. Well, when she finally closed, they decided to take that out and send it to the island. And that's the reason why that hole's there. They did it the easiest way. They just simply went in there with a big crane and lifted her out and took her away. Jim, the, uh, the towns stayed about the same in population. But the closing of a big mill like this must have had a, had a real effect on the place. Well, yes, it certainly did. Have a, it had a big effect on the place. It had a big effect on the men, too. When she was going, the men had they took pride in this place. When she finished, they lost their pride. They more or less lost their purpose. Now, as for the little town, we, we had two grocer's shops, butcher's shops, Four hotels. Now we've got two hotels, no butcher shop, one grocery shop. Mm. Phil, it's, it's not good. There's a story of Ross tied up in dying industries then. No, Chris, that's not the full story at all. Old industries have died, but there'll be new industries that have begun too. Possum factory is the town's youngest industry, but already it's processing 500 skins a week and supplying markets as distant as the United States and Japan. It's New Zealand possums, Chris, that make that Davy Crockett hat, and koala bears for the Australian market. And there's another local industry still flourishing. They've been quarrying high-quality limestone on the terrace above Donnelly's Creek since 1918. Lime to fertilise the soils of West Coast farms. Over 23,000 tonnes of lime last year. There's enough limestone in this hill to carry Ross into the next century. Chris, you've seen some of the industries that keep Ross going. But you know, maybe here, in its history, there's a great new industry for the future. junction and the 